Good evening. evening. Grace and peace to you all as we gather uh, to remember the cross, as we gather to remember our Christ dying for us this evening, as we renew our dedication to the Lord. We gather tonight uh, to remember the purpose of the cross. We gather tonight to pause and re-examine our lives. Welcome to all who, of you who are gathered here in person, and also those of you who are worshiping with us online. I encourage you to let go of any distractions and focus in as we uh, prepare our hearts for worship this evening. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah 53. You can see the call to worship available and your bulletins as well as the screen in front of you. Please follow along in the bolded words. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we account him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Let us pray. O Christ, who forsook no one, but was forsaken by the closest of friends, and who committed no crime, yet was sentenced to a criminal's death. We enter your presence in awe and adoration. On this day, centuries ago, you could have saved your life, but you refused to betray the purpose for which you had been born. You had come into the world to love God and love neighbor as yourself. And when that love required you to shoulder the cross, you summon the strength to bear it. So today, O Christ, as we sing and pray and listen about the cross, teach us its meaning once again and help us to take up our cross and follow you. May this worship be pleasing to you and only you, our rock and our redeemer. For this we pray in your holy name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite us to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together this new hymn, The Power of the Cross.
be seated. At this time, I uh, invite us to have our communion elements prepared as we come before the Lord's Supper. If you have, if you are here in person, the communion elements are uh, available for you uh, in, uh, in in our church mailboxes. As we approach the table, we give thanks and praise for God's work of creation, liberation, and salvation. It is indeed our right, our duty, and delight that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to our holy God, our God who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Our Lord made us in his image and in countless ways showed us mercy beyond measure. Our Lord, who came in flesh to take on the sins of this world. So we gather. We gather at this table to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. All glory and blessing are yours, O holy God. For in your mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ. He took our human nature and suffered death on the cross for our redemption. There he made a perfect sacrifice for the sins for the whole world. We praise you that before he suffered and died, our Savior gave us this holy sacrament and commanded us to continue it until he comes again. Have your way, O oh Lord. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same night, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the, new, is, is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to, do, to join me in this litany as we remember the, the Lord's table. We remember God's gracious love for us. Christ's death and resurrection for us and the Spirit's tender care for us. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Merciful God, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that in eating and drinking we may be made one with Christ and one another. Amen. Church, the gift of God for the people of God, the body of Christ broken for you. Church, the blood of Christ shed for you. Please join me in this prayer of confession. You can follow along with the words printed in your bulletin and the screen in front of you. Merciful God, we meet each other today at the foot of the cross as inhabitants of one world. 
we wait with each other as those who inflict wounds on another. Be merciful to us. As those who deny justice to others, be merciful to us. As those who put our trust in power, be merciful to us. As those who are greedy, be merciful to us. As those who put others on trial, be merciful to us. As those who refuse to receive, be merciful to us. As those who are afraid of the world's torment, be merciful to us. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Amen. I invite us to rise in body or in spirit as I worship the Lord with this uh, hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. Before we turn to God's word, I just want to share a couple announcements for us. 
Uh, just a reminder, our uh, a sunrise service will be at 7 a.m. on Sunday at Heckscher State Park at Field 6 by where the, the bathhouse is. Um, so uh, please make sure uh, you know that. Uh, we don't know if we can live stream it um, because uh, we don't know how cell phone service is. But if I can go live from my phone for those who are unable to make it, we will try to do our best. Um, I think uh, we've had some uh, uh, live streaming issues tonight with the internet. So uh, we might have lost some folks because we started a new stream. Um, but if you are still on this current stream and you uh, see uh, me right now, uh, thank you for jumping onto the new stream and not uh, giving up. Um, and uh, for those of you who will be watching the archive later, uh, welcome to you as well. Um, and and uh, also, our Easter uh, morning, we will have our... Lily's Easter flowers, so if you would like to bring your flowers, please uh, bring that uh, before the 1030 service. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not going to do the Easter, our annual Easter breakfast, um, but uh, we will be here for our 1030 resurrection celebration. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think those are the announcements we have for today. Uh, let's turn to God's word. God's word tonight comes from the psalmist. Psalm 51, verse 7. Psalm 51, verse 7. God's word tonight comes to us from Psalm 51, verse 7. The scripture is available in your bulletins as well as your screen in front of you. So I invite us to rise in body and spirit if you're there, so that we can honor the sacredness of God's holy word. It is only one verse, so I'll invite us to read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer once again as we ask God to illuminate our hearts. With that jar full of sour wine, with a sponge full of that wine on that branch of hyssop held to your mouth. Jesus, you received it, and you said it was finished. As we spend time in your presence tonight, speak through this unworthy vessel. Let the words coming out of this mouth not be the words of any man, but the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this we pray in your holy name, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. When we think of the word spring cleaning, we usually think of that as an opportunity to get rid of things that we do not use or we do not need. For some of us, we don't like spring cleaning because we don't like getting rid of things that we do not need or we do not use. But usually when it comes to spring cleaning, we take that opportunity to clean up and get rid of things that hinder us from cleanliness or organization. We can't just throw everything into boxes, into a single room, and just hope for the best. We can't just throw everything into boxes, into a little storage room, and just hope for the best. But as I was preparing this message, church, I realized, and I, and I, I, I had to repent. Because spiritually, we need to do spring cleaning as well. We need to purge and get rid of things that hinder us from Christ. You see, if we don't see the need to purge, if we don't see the need to clean our hearts regularly, then we're missing the point of the gospel. We need to do that spring cleaning in our hearts, and it can't be just once a year. Now, the psalmist starts us off with the word purge which was used in accordance with the word sin because it literally was defined as de-sinning, de-sin. Because David knew that he could not cleanse himself. 
David knew that he needed God to cleanse him. He knew that he needed the blood of the perfect sacrifice to cleanse him. Over the past year, thanks to the pandemic, I feel like we have all become experts in regards to Clorox wipes, Lysol wipes, and various cleaning supplies, especially with how limited the supplies were. But if you think about it, why were people stocking up? Why were people hoarding these cleaning supplies? Because they knew in order to purge and clean surfaces from any germs, they needed those supplies. They needed that Clorox wipe. They needed that Lysol wipe. They, you know, getting it for someone was like the best present out there during this pandemic especially because of how hard it was to find it, but also because it was that important to have it. But I want you to imagine with me, when it comes to purging and, and, and the cleansing of our souls, why aren't we going after Christ like we did those cleaning supplies? Why aren't we climbing, getting in line to try to go after Christ like we did for those toilet paper rolls? Why aren't we standing in line to hear the gospel? Why aren't we standing in line to share the gospel like we did at Costco back on March 12th, 2020? Oh my word, that was a long line. Why are we not ready to stand in line to share the gospel to get what we need to purge our hearts and clean our hearts, which is Jesus If we're so busy and purging and cleaning the things around us, why aren't we busy cleaning the things in our hearts that hinder us? If we're so busy worried about the things around us to make sure it's clean, why aren't we putting in that effort to make sure that there are things in our hearts that are not, that are not hindering us from growing closer in our faith in Christ? Church, we cannot worry about purging and cleaning the things around us when we don't make any efforts to purge and cleanse our hearts from the things of the world and within us. Now, what is this hyssop? Now, hyssop is a bitter plant from uh, what's the mint family that's often believed to be filled with a lot of antibacterial properties. Hyssop is mentioned several times throughout scripture in what seems to be small and insignificant ways, but in reality is the priestly ministry of purification. Back in the Old Testament, hyssop was used to cleanse leprosy in Leviticus 14. In the book of Numbers, the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to burn hyssop with cedar wood and scarlet as a purification for sin. In Exodus, the children of Israel were commanded to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in blood, then strike the lintel and doorpost of their home so that when the Lord passed over to destroy the Egyptians, he would pass over the homes of the Israelites, which is the Passover that's celebrated today. So we can see that hyssop was associated often with cleansing and protection in Scripture. From the applying of the blood of the Passover lamb to the priests sprinkling purifying water, hyssop was significant. It was important. But little did they know, hundreds of years later, that hyssop would be used again. You see, when Jesus hung on the cross, he was given a vinegar-soaked sponge placed upon hyssop an Old Testament purification sacrifice coming back to being used when Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice. That hyssop being lifted high to the one on the cross. The story of Exodus is ultimately the story of the cross. The story of the cross is God's offering of himself to bring us out of slavery, to bring us out of the shackles of sin once and for all. Abraham's trust in the Lord finds its true fulfillment on the cross as the Lord provides the sacrificial lamb. Now to end the psalm, the psalmist then testifies and says, 
Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The psalmist knew that God's cleansing was effective, that it worked. He knew that sin was a deep stain and those stains can stay for a while, but God's cleansing can do the impossible. Charles Spurgeon once said, God can make him as if he had never sinned at all. Such is the power of the cleansing work of God upon the heart that he can restore innocence to us and make us as if we had never been stained with transgression at all. We hear the psalmist speaking with faith. We hear the psalmist speaking with that expectation and anticipation of knowing what the Lord can and will do. What does it mean to be a Christian? I want us to think about that question. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means that we confess our sins, right? If we're a Christian, it means that we turn away from our sinful lifestyle by allowing Jesus as his beloved to wash us and cleanse us with his blood. The cleansing isn't a free pass to do whatever we want. The cleansing is our identity in Christ. There are times when we become lazy in our faith. There are times when we rack up all the excuses in the world with our faith. There are times when we say, hmm, now that there's a a live stream, I'm just going to be comfortable and I'll sit at home and I'll just turn it on my TV. I'm not being passive here. But there are times when we become lazy with our faith. There are times when we falter and fall back into temptation one too many times. And it's in those moments that we have to remember that the purging, that the cleansing, that the repentance that is in, that is needed to be done, it's not a chore. It's a privilege. But most importantly, it's our identity in Christ. If we are afraid to repent, if we are afraid to purge, if we are afraid to turn away from the world, if we are afraid to do the regular spring cleaning that is needed in our hearts to ensure that nothing is hindering us from Christ, then we are avoiding our identity in Christ. It's not just the once a year Good Friday, all right, that's right, I have to repent, all right, good. It's not a once a year thing. It's at every moment of our lives. Responsibility and call and privilege we have in our lives. Because that's our identity. We shouldn't be afraid to repent. We shouldn't be afraid to purge and go start cleaning our hearts. Because that's our identity. Too many times we let the things of the world infiltrate our hearts and we forget Too many times we let the things of the world infiltrate our hearts and we disregard it. But if we want to stand true to our identity in Christ, we need to face this purging, this cleansing, this repentance over and over again and claim it as our identity in Christ. How often do we ask God to reveal our sin? How often do we ask God for forgiveness? Even in days where we think, "Mm, I I, I didn't do anything bad today. You see, sin, sin is scary. Thinking that we're right all the time is scary. Because in reality, if we're not right in the eyes of the Lord, that's even scarier. I know it's painful to pray these prayers. It hurts to acknowledge how little we are in the eyes of the world and and in the eyes of Christ. But it's that much powerful to acknowledge how little we are and how much more we need Christ. The psalmist spoke of God cleansing him with hyssop. Because he was alluding to the hyssop used at the religious ceremony to sprinkle sacrificial blood on the altar. But most importantly, because he knew that it represented the removal of sin through the shedding of the blood. 
You know, many of us are guilty of being busy praying prayers of petition that, that we hardly remember to pray prayers for the removal of our sin over and over and over again. It's almost like we're afraid of praying a prayer of repentance. But you see, even in sorrow and shame, God calls us to pray this prayer of the psalmist. Purge me with hyssop. Purge me with hyssop. That shouldn't be a once a year thing. Because that's our identity in Christ. May we never take that as a chore. May we never take that as a, a responsibility that we're afraid to do. But may we take that as a privilege. But most, but most importantly, may we remember that as our identity as sons and daughters of Christ. Let us pray. Jesus, we remember the cross. We remember your sacrifice. We remember tonight the blood that was shed for us. Lord, we confess. Lord, we repent. Lord, we confess to you that there have been one too many times where we have forgotten about the power of the blood. Lord, we repent that there have been one too many times where we think we were right, but in the eyes of the Lord, we weren't. So as we yearn to testify this prayer, purge me with hyssop, may that be our identity in you. We thank you for the power of the gospel. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. At this time, uh, we have a Good Friday, Friday litany that we will participate in together. And after we participate in this Good Friday litany, uh, the lights will go off for about 30 seconds to a minute. And when the lights go off, I encourage you to, to, to pray, to meditate, to dwell. And then after about 30 seconds to a minute, um, we will rise to sing a what wondrous love. So I encourage us to, uh, uh, I invite us to, to turn to the litany that is available in your bulletin as well as the screen in front of you. I invite you to follow along in the bolded words. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said, You have said so. So then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man, but he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jude, from Galilee even to this place. He is guilty. The chief priests and scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Pilate told the chief priests and the crowds, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him, neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. Away with this man and release to us the prisoner Barabbas, the man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city and for murder. Pilate went ahead and asked them once more if they desired to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him.
May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with the wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you and all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace.